Well, we, are, we have a topical this morning. We'll return to verse by verse in Romans, Lord willing, next Sunday. But this morning, if you have your Bibles, some of you might want to turn to the table of contents. <laughs> Philemon, Phil Lemon. <laughs> Philemon, only one chapter. And uh, we are going to stand in a moment and take verses 4 through 7, but I'm going to give you a little extra time to find your place in Paul's letter to a man named Philemon. Time's up. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. Verses 4 through 7. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Please be seated. Well, I wanted to keep going. There's an awkward stop there. Oasis is the name, the title of this morning's message. But before I get into the message, I want to address those who don't believe, and maybe there are no unbelievers present, well, then the believers might be able to use some of this for ammunition when they are in front of the unbeliever. Uh, This letter and these applications are solely intended for believers, this letter here to Philemon. To unbelievers, God says that you are a sinner, no matter what you think. He says that only his divine son can rescue you from your sinful state and the consequences of being a sinner. And to be offended by this fact is to offend God. God is not backing down and neither are his prophets. Peter preached this in the book of Acts, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord follows into the message that uh, we will consider this morning. Even though Peter is addressing unbelievers, he is promising refreshment to those who do believe because you're going to need it. Confess you are a sinner and unworthy of heaven like the rest of us. This is the gospel. If Christ does not wash the sinner, the sinner cannot enter heaven. It is a big deal. Well, that's the preface. The message, Oasis, our text, is the seventh verse. Again, looking at Philemon, and you might want to keep your place there. I will reference the letter several times. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. A fertile spot in a desert, that's what an oasis is. Where water is found, where water is in demand. Uh, That serves as an excellent metaphor, a backdrop for this characteristic, this Christian characteristic. Oh, it can be found in others too, but the Christians are supposed to all have the ability to refresh others, not just ourselves. By Lehman's reputation for refreshing believers was known in the church. There are different forms of attack that we can use against Satan. In World War II, the code breakers exercised a form of attack. They significantly impacted the outcome of World War II. In the Old Testament, there was my favorite, Abigail. She went on the attack. Instead of waiting for David, to retaliate against her husband Nabal's insults and come and wipe everybody out, she loaded up the donkey with goods and she intercepted David. She went on the attack. And as a result, she stopped the slaughter. Then in the New Testament, we have our hero here, Philemon. 
he would go on the attack too. And he reinvigorated the troops. Because that's what we're supposed to be. We sing the song, Onward Christian Soldiers. Even though D.L. Moody <laughs> did not want that song to be sung by Ira Sankey, his music, music leader. Because Moody thought that the, the Christians were making themselves a poor example of an army at the time. You know, there's some truth to that. The devil is not too concerned about those who are preoccupied with defense. Now, some of you know I'm, I'm not a fan of that saying, I'm hanging in there. It sounds like you just set, it, set up for ambush or to be attacked with little defense. I don't mean anything serious about it. If you want to still say, I'm hanging in there, that's fine. I'm not going to judge you, except I'll say I don't like that one. I'd rather be in pursuit than be pursued. I'd rather be the hunter than the hunted. In the book of Judges, we have this illustrated. And I'm talking about spiritual things. I'm talking about when we're driving. In the book of Judges, Gideon rallied the army to come against those who were slaughtering and oppressing the people of God. And during the chase, we have this recorded in Judges chapter 8 and 4th verse. When Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 300 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted but still in pursuit. That should be Christianity when under pressure. Exhausted and still a threat to the interests of hell, whatever they may be. And they're clearly laid out in Scripture. The enemy knows that when we sit, in a defensive position, he knows where we are. He knows what we have. Devils are more afraid of those who are ready to attack, ready to do something in the interest of the kingdom. Even if we are outnumbered by circumstances, there is always opportunity for God, whether we are the underdog or the overdog. The godly king Hezekiah, Hezekiah told his troops there on the battlefield facing the Assyrian army in 2 uh, Chronicles, we have it, in chapter 32. You want the verse, don't you? But I'm not giving it. You'll have to read the chapter. Be strong and courageous, verse 7. <laughs> Do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude that is with him, for there are more with us than with him. That's spiritual talk. That's faith, mouthing off proper things. That's a righteous indignation at work. This letter to Philemon, brief but beautiful, written from jail. Paul's not on the defense. He's on the offense. At this time, he writes the letter to the Colossians, probably another letter to those in Laodicea. He also writes at this time the Ephesian letter. He was very busy going at the enemy. This letter is sent by one of those faithful servants of Paul, Tychicus, and in his company, another man named Onesimus. They're going to Colossae, along with two other letters, as I mentioned. The letter to, well, I didn't mention this part, a letter to the Colossians that we have, and this letter to Philemon. Uh, this is addressed, of course, to the man named Philemon, and his wife and son are also mentioned in verse 2. We know the outcome of this letter, what happens in this discussion, but I don't want to get ahead of myself, because this letter is not written concerning church business or doctrinal truths, as some of the other letters are. But it is about a runaway slave who had come to Rome. And he probably stole some things also from his slave owner, who was a Christian, Philemon. This slave, Onesimus, he's converted when he gets to Rome under Paul's ministry. This is the letter from Paul about that runaway slave. Look at verse 10 if you still have your Bibles open to Philemon. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. Paul is sending him back, sending him back to be a slave to face Philemon, who he had wronged. From the slave owner's standpoint, 
runaways in those days had to be made an example. And a smack on the wrist was insufficient, unacceptable. This was some of the pressure that would come on Philemon when Onesimus comes back and says, I have wronged you. I've given my life to Christ. We're brothers now. What do you want to do with this situation? The possibility existed because of this social institution that was so entrenched in the society, the possibility existed that Philemon might dismiss Paul's appeal. Paul is interceding on behalf of Onesimus. That means that Paul possibly sent Onesimus to his death. That could have been the outcome. Then Paul would have to have grieved over the death, death of Onesimus and the ruin of his apparently close friend, Philemon. But Philemon had a reputation for being a blessing, and Paul knew that. As a matter of fact, Paul is over 900, mile, uh, 900 ancient miles away. That means there's no flight. It probably means it was easier to get to knowing how flying is. Word reached Paul some 900 miles away in a Roman jail about the generosity and kindness of this man, Philemon. So Paul speaks to Philemon in verses 5 and 6 as a faithful, beloved brother. This shows us the way to get things done in the future by getting things out of the past. What he got out of the past was Philemon's history, his testimony, his reputation, what he was known for, refreshing the brethren, his love, his generosity, his kindness. The church met in his house. His son was likely the pastor. Verse 2, Archippus was likely the pastor of the church that is there in Colossae. Paul's going to use this information. On behalf of Onesimus, not himself. Paul held spiritual authority over this man Philemon. We're told that. He held the spiritual authority by consent. Not force. If you look with me now at verses 8 through 14. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting. Yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. Being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me that on your behalf he might minister to me in my change for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. How powerful is that? Paul is saying, I love Onesimus. I want him to stay with me. But that's not the right thing. The right thing is to send him back to you. That you could receive him, that I could still be a blessing from the jail in Rome. Paul's intercessory prayer, words that were courteous and tactful and loving. Think of the men that Paul commanded by consent, by their appreciation for him, what he meant to them. There was Titus. We have Paul's letter to Titus. There was Timothy. We have his two letters to Timothy. Tertius, Epaphras, Epaphroditus, John Mark, Luke, Aristarchus, Trophimus, Pudens, Onesimus, Philemon, and there are others. We'll come to one more before we finish this morning. That's the plan. Each life that I just listed was refreshed by some Barnabas or some Philemon-type Christian because tin does not sharpen iron. Iron sharpens iron. People who are made from the right stuff in Christ Jesus. Maybe they weren't the right stuff before. As Onesimus, he wasn't the right stuff when he landed in Rome. He became a better person because he applied the gospel that he received. 
And we refresh hearts through firm hearts in Christ by less judgment and more joy. That might not be the case when you're in private. In private, you may be wailing before the Lord. You may be hurting before the Lord. But then you get up off your knees, you stand amongst the saints, and you get back into the rhythm of serving. I do. I go to the Lord and to the Lord, I tell him all the things I don't like about this life, all the things that are wrong. I, I discuss it with him in great reverence, but straight out. I learned that from Jeremiah. And then I get up off my knees and I go do what I'm supposed to do. I do my duty. A great many times, my request, the answer comes back, no. That's all, no. I still get up and do what I'm supposed to do because I know what my role is as a Christian. And if you don't know what your role is as a Christian, well, don't fall apart because of that, but apply yourself and find out. We need to be refreshed. And it does not mean that when we need to be refreshed, we cannot at the same time refresh others. You think every day was good for Philemon? Of course not. He had moods too, like everybody else. The man made of the, just flesh and blood like we are. We have carn he has a carnal nature just like us. But that's not what the record records, like those heroes in chapter 11 of Hebrews. We could say a lot of bad things about some of the things of some of those in Hebrews 11, and they'd be true. Samson, for example. Well, we are, as Christians, to not wait to feel good to do our duty, although I prefer to feel good when doing my duty, and I get a lot of those days too. It's not all doom and gloom. But I am more than a servant, and so are you in Christ. You're not only family with God, you're friends with God. You know, you can be family and not very friendly. And you can be friends and not family. But in Christ, they join together. Jesus said, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. He promoted them. Friends bring out the best in each other. That's what goes with friendship, true friendship. But now there's, this is spiritual. The, the spiritual members and sincere friends, spiritual friends also. Families played a dominant role in the Old Testament and in the forming of the church. Of course, there were, you know, Peter and Andrew. There's John and his brother James. There's Martha and, and Mary. <clears throat> Families are pronounced in Scripture. But so are those without family. So like such, <clears throat> even Paul had family. Paul, he counted Philemon as a friend and as family. And as such, he gave Philemon the benefit of the doubt. Something I have learned a lot of Christians will not do for other Christians or pastors. So you hear some gossip, you know, and you oh, he must be rotten. And you say, wait, wait, give the person the benefit of the doubt if you have no reason to line up against them. On the word of a little butterfly. As such, he trusted the life of Onesimus in the hands of Philemon, sending him back as a runaway slave returning home. In verse 1, Paul said, Paul, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. I would love for a man like Paul to say that about me. There is an adjective which the word friend will not tolerate. It is the adjective insincere. Sincerity is the backbone of friendship. What happens to a friendship if the person is fake? Oh, I'm so happy to see you. And they're really not. And you know it. I mean, who wants that? A servant, a servant can hold their peace, shut their mouth. An employee can be quiet because they're afraid of losing their job and flatter, and be insincere, but not a friend, not a true friend. I think if more people have friends, there'd be less people in need of counseling. Because a friend can tell you like it is, or at least give you another perspective that you might need to hear and would benefit from. Sincerity alone, however, is not enough, but um, 
It won't tolerate falsity. It won't tolerate someone being fake. In a casual relationship, we desire that the other person is sincere, but it is not ne as necessary as with a friend. And we are friends, again, with Christ. We are family with Christ. We are to be friends with each other, and we are to be family with each other. Now, again, within that circle of friends and family, there are going to be people that maybe just, you know, keep you a little bit more uncomfortable than somebody else. I'm being polite. <laughs> you know, there's some people you say something to them and they always disagree or go opposite. And that might not be, you know, I'd rather be around the person like, yeah, Rick, you're always right. I love you so much. The greatest friend I ever had. And of course, we don't want some false flattery. But in higher relationships, sincerity is indispensable. And this is what's going on with these two men, Paul and Philemon. There is sincerity between the two. Verse 17, Paul says to him, Then, if you then count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. That's confidence. That's friendship. To be a genuine oasis to others, a place of relief. Verse 7, again, our text, for we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you. I'd like that to be said about me also. There are a lot of things in the Bible I don't want to be said about me, but there are a lot that I would love to be the recipient of to refresh presupposes toil, work, weariness, spent, being spent. Paul said, I will gladly be spent for you. You know, you're exhausted, out of bullets, out of gas. How can a Christian be untouched by such a text? Because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you. Any Christian that reads that should, that hopefully would stand out, yes, I would like to be a part of that. I'd like to have some of that in my life. To refresh those in need genuinely, there should be, there must be genuine faith. And here's why. Liking a person is irrelevant. Loving the Lord Jesus is imperative. If you're going to refresh people, you can't pick and choose. Well, I like this one, but I don't like that one. Christ doesn't treat you that way. He was a friend of publicans. He was a friend of sinners. He gave sinners a chance. So much so, his high-minded enemies hated him for daring to be around the low-class people. Matthew chapter 25, I say to you, Jesus speaking, inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. That's pretty serious. But it also brings up a question. Am I the problem? Am I the one somebody else needs to be refreshed from because of me? Do they have to be refreshed? Do I cause others to be spent unnecessarily, unfairly? Because of my carnal, Christless behavior? I hope not. There are no shortage of parched souls to come across in need. There's always a need for an oasis. And each of us should have one of those in our, on our tool belt. Refreshing others is going on the attack. Make no mistake about that. Facing the enemy creates needs. We know that. Samson, after engaging the enemy, was so dehydrated, he thought he would die. We picked that one up in Judges 15 also. <clears throat> then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, heaps upon heaps, I've slain a thousand men. And so it was when he had finished speaking that he threw the jawbone from his hand. Then he became very thirsty, so he cried out to the Lord. And now shall I die of thirst? So God split the hollow place, and water came out, and he drank. And his spirit returned, and he was revived. God refreshed him. 
Philemon was God's place to refresh thirsty warriors. Maybe you haven't slain heaps upon heaps, but you've done something and it's worn you out. And you could use a word in season. You can use a genuine encouragement, not the fake ones. The fake ones are counterproductive. They're the enemy, the genuine ones. It's things like, hang in there. It's going to get worse. <laughs> but you will survive. In the end, when the smoke clears, you're either going to be a better servant here or you'll be in heaven. But hang in there with the Lord. If you're going to use that phrase, hang in there, Hang in there and attack. Philemon was God's place to refresh thirsty warriors. Verse 20, Paul said to him, Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. You have this reputation for refreshing people. I could use some of that myself. Endeavor to refresh. I haven't prepared a topical because it's New Year's. Well, let's have a New Year's message. I think the scripture speaks to every day, not just a New Year's Day or a New Year's Eve. I do believe that it is very helpful to get a head start on problems, to early on settle the issue. Well, I'm going to stand strong on this one. I'm going to do this. I find that that helps. It may not take away the problem, but it enhances my performance in the problem, and that's what God is interested in, how I behave when the arrows are flying. Will I learn how to apply these truths from Scripture to my life? Will I refresh others given the chance? Maybe, maybe I can pray for others like Moses prayed over Joshua and the army there in the valley against the Amalekites. God is saying in that story, don't underestimate your prayers. Don't count yourself out. You may not be on the battlefield, but you can contribute to the outcome of the battle from wherever you are. Moses was up on a hilltop, sitting on a rock eventually. Others were helping, hold, helping him, holding up his arms. Or maybe I, I could be uh, reminded, or maybe I could be the one that reminds, like, Abigail reminded David, when she intercepted David on his way to slaughter the men where she lived, she told David all about God's plan for his life. And it changed everything. I mentioned that there was another man on the list, and we come to him now. We read about him in 2 Timothy. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's mentioning this man who was just so special, a special part in his life. He says, the Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. He didn't care that I was in jail and what people thought about that. Earlier we read, Paul said, he sought me out. There were a few million people in Rome, and Onesimus found him. And when he found him, he, contribute, he contributed to the man's ministry. He refreshed him. And Paul never forgot it. And he wanted Timothy to know it. He wanted the church where Timothy pastored there in Ephesus, likely at the time. He wanted them to know it. So Paul offers Philemon a chance to be a larger blessing than just those in the congregation. Here was coming to him a personal problem. You see, in ministry, you have a lot of problems in ministry. Then there's personal issues. You get more problems, I think, coming from uh, the, the public issues of ministry. But family can, can have their challenges, as we all know, some more than others. Well, Paul is extending the opportunity to the man. Christ says, I'll make it worth it. I'll make it worth your while. Matthew 10, 42, and whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. That cup of cold water is refreshing, especially when you're parched. What I do for Christ will include discomfort to me, 
because of original sin. Why do people get sick and die? Original sin, not personal individual sin, original sin from the Garden of Eden, the curse that is on mankind. Death entered the world. We, we have, we, whether you accept it or not, that's the way it is. Am I ever used to refresh the weary servant? And if not, why not? Why does God skip past me and use someone else to do what I should be doing? I don't care for that. It was a point where, you know, most Christians don't know what go, what's involved in, in building a church. If, if the scale is this big, they most know that much. You have to be in it to really get it, to get it into your bones, what it takes. And doing so, there are going to be times when the verse, no man having set his hands to the plow, looking back, is fit to the kingdom. You're going to think about that. Now, that's not an absolute, well, let me put it this way. The answer to that verse is not on the surface. It goes deeper. And I can say that because if you look at the life of Jeremiah, he looked back all the time. But he kept plowing. So there's more to the meaning than just what's on the surface. And in that time, you, you want to say, so when Jeremiah wanted to leave the ministry, if he, when he just wanted to get away, when David wanted to just fly away, take wings of, the, of a dove and fly away, if God had materialized in front of them and said, well, then maybe I'll get somebody else to do it, I think they would have kind of stood firm. Said, oh, I'll do this. I got it. And I think we should know about these things. If there are things that I should be doing, I do not want God to disqualify me and qualify someone else because I refused the inconvenience. Even under pressure, we are all expected to carry out our mission. We are still to apply our Christianity. I think the problems become smaller when we respond to them that way. Uh, it, it's just a fact. We, you know, when we say, fine, I'm going to make this thing chop wood and fetch water. That's what Joshua did when he was lied to, when he was betrayed, when the people wanted to turn against him. David, when they wanted to turn against him. Uh, they wanted to kill David. They wanted to stone him. Uh, they did this uh, several times. They did it to, the, to, to Moses when the spies came back and said, you know, we can take the giants and the other ten said, no, we can't. The people wanted to stone them. And yet we remember how they stood firm because they applied their faith. Second Samuel gives us a picture of another saint applying the faith, going on the attack. This is easier to read than to have stood there and did what he did. But here it comes. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about great victory that day. It costs to have victory is what I'm saying. We boast of being more than conquerors in Christ. Romans chapter 8. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. Yeah, we are more than conquerors. We are friends and family of God and each other. But true victories or for those who are willing to pay the price. And that lesson comes off the pages of Scripture time and time again. Just consider Joseph in prison for doing the right thing, for standing up for morality, for honoring God. Verse 18 of Philemon, Paul says this. Now, when I'm talking about the price of victory, and this is on a smaller scale because Paul in a dungeon, that was the price of victory. But he writes to him, he says, if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I'll pay for it. I'll pay for whatever he did wrong. That's how much Onesimus means to me. And that's how much you mean to me, Philemon. I don't want you to suffer loss. I'll pay for it. I don't. Philemon was a well-to-do guy, even if he weren't. How do we know? How do we know what he did with this? Well, he publishes the letter. There's a personal letter to Philemon, even though he addresses his wife and his son as a courtesy in the letter. It's to Philemon. And he gets his letter and he reads it and he, it's preserved through the centuries. He didn't put it to the match. These Bible records are to stir our hearts to believe in what we claim to believe. 
I love this verse in Joshua chapter 11. Here's another one that I would like applied to me. I don't mean this in a selfish way, but it would be foolish to want less. This is what it says, a summary on the servant Joshua. As the Lord had commanded Moses, his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. They're commandments. They're not popular many times, or else they would be called likes. I'm giving you a like. Um, well, don't we have something like that? Yeah, never mind. <laughs> They're commandments, and you're to follow them, like them or not. Again, you do not have to like people. I know. But you do have to love them. And I know. I've never loved so many people until I became a Christian. I sure disliked a lot of people before I became a Christian. But God changes us, even though we don't see it. In fact, I'm not even mindful of that until I just said it. Would patting myself on the back be wrong right now? <laughs> it's all the work of Christ, as Paul points out here. It's because of Christ. It is because of Jesus, as he said in verse 6, which is in you, in Christ Jesus. You did it because of Christ in you. I'm almost done. Bible lessons are to count towards service. And it hurts when we have all the scripture verses lined up and we're not getting the results that we want and we feel justified in our cries. But that's when Satan is attacked. When we don't understand why God this or why God that, but we stand our ground because we know the truth. This is what is in demand for us and through us. If you see others slipping away, pray to God that you may be trustworthy enough to strengthen that soul, to reach that soul before it is too late. May God give us eyes to discern what's going on with those in need and be this spiritual oasis. A year from now, will you recall that a pastor preached on refreshing others? Or maybe you're one of those Christians that you only crave sermons that excuse your service, especially when life hurts. That won't help you. It won't help anybody else. The man I read about swinging the sword until it was attached to his arm, everybody else fled. He stood his ground. I can tell you to make yourself count for the king with a boldness not found in other kingdoms. Our citizenship is in heaven. I close with this verse because it talks about what is set in the days of great apostasy. And Elijah the prophet called for a duel between the false prophets and their God and he, the prophet of Yahweh. This is the one where the fire came from heaven and Elijah set the terms. The God who answers by fire, he is God. And, uh, you know, his, his student, Elisha, you know, he gets to the Jordan after Elijah is taken up in a chariot of fire. He gets to the Jordan and he says, uh, where is the God of Elijah? And he touches the water with the mantle and the water's part and he crosses over. And I bring these two things up to show you two examples of, of, of profound scripture verses. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Where is the God of Elijah? But in my life, there have been times where... I have said the God who answers by fire. He is God and no fire has come down. But faith is a fire. To trust God based on the facts that you know about God, that's a fire. Hell can't put that one out. And then I've been up against Jordans and I have said, you know, where is the God of Elijah? Where is the God of Elijah? And he's saying right here. Well, you're not close enough. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah, well, since you're here, can you do something? Yeah, I'll be God, and you be my servant. That's the arrangement. Do you agree to that? I still agree to that. Yes, Lord. So here they are up on Mount Carmel, Carmel by the sea. And uh, the people were spiritually in a state of disrepair. And Elijah was there to build them up. 
And we just read this, and I'll let you just fill in the blanks, and then we'll close in prayer. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 30. Then Elijah said to, the, to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Oh, I'd like to be that kind of man. Let's pray. Our Father, this morning, as we who believe, consider the things that you have preserved for us in Scripture and see how we're going to respond to them. As we do these things, may you find us pliable in your hands. May you find us ready servants. May we not be thin-skinned, but tough, because your Spirit is in us. If you've been listening and you've never opened your heart to Christ, and that first part of the sermon, if you caught it, applies to you, you are a sinner. You don't have to like it or agree with it. It's a fact, and it's not going to change. But you can be a sinner saved by grace, by the kindness, the undeserved kindness of God. But you got to come. It has to be of your own free will. God will not force you to believe in him. That would not be love. If you want to receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior, if you want the penalty for your sin taken away, if you want heaven at the end of this life, then make this prayer with me in earnest, and God will receive you. That's his promise. If you say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I am one who breaks your commandments. And I ask you to forgive me. I come to you and you alone. There is no one else worthy. There's no one else who died for me on a cross. There's no one else who rose again and ascended to heaven and sits in the right hand of the throne of God. I give my life to you right here, right now. And from this day forward, I ask that you would be not only the one who saves my soul from judgment to come, but also the one who lords over my life right here, right now. And now, Father, if anybody has made this prayer this morning, when invited at the end of the service to come up and share with the pastors, may they not hesitate. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.